Wonderful Savior, wonderful God, wonderful God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's who he is. Join with us as we declare the blessings of God of our life through our confession. Father, I thank you that I know the season that I'm operating in. Your perfect timing. I know your will for my life. And I will under circumstances, people, or things I see happening around me. Move me out of my season or rob me of my harvest. Father, I am committed to prayer, studying your word, and walking in obedience. I know your voice in the voice of a stranger. I will not follow. I hear your voice saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. I would not miss out on my harvest, nor will I fail to accomplish your plan and your purpose for my life. I will not quit. Therefore, I cannot and I will not be defeated. I will let patience have a perfect work in me. I'm confident that I will endure until the end and I will enjoy the reward of my harvest. Let's give God another ovation of praise, if you will. Amen. You may take your seats if you can. We thank and honor God for you being here this morning. Glorious service coming to you live from the North World Family Worship Center for you that are online. For you that are here in the sanctuary enjoying the blessings and praise. Let's give God a, a, bless, a, a, a round of praise for his anointing and presence being in his place this morning. <clears throat> We're continuing to minister to you on the line of overcoming the fear of sharing your faith, sharing Jesus. But our subtitle that we're sp uh, still on to the today is coming over uh, later from Thursday, a continuation, is bring unsaved to decision. Tell your neighbor, say once you've shared your faith, say you need to bring the unsaved to the decision. Now what I mean by that, I mean is it doesn't do any good for you to educate people about Jesus. Doesn't do any good for you to encourage them, give them words of encouragement, tell them about the good news, tell them about Jesus. It doesn't, good, it doesn't do any good for you to tell them anything about God if at some point you don't get to the point where you offer them the opportunity to meet the same Jesus you met when you gave your life to the Lord. You're going to find me reading our theme scripture in the book of St. John, the sixth chapter, verse 44, Amplified Classic. And as we told you many times, this, you know, th this, this particular series of teaching that I'm giving you should take all the pressure off of you about sharing your faith with people about being a Christian. This should take all the pressure off because you realize you can't fail. You can't mess it up. You can't go wrong. You can't do it wrong as long as you follow the steps that I'm giving you. And we there, at first of all, there were uh, 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 five questions we asked people, uh, you know, th th that were kind of spiritual thermometers to find out whether God has already been working in that person's life. Because, see, when I first came to the Lord, you know, we, we just went through the streets. We went into the clubs, we went to people's houses. You know, and we basically jacked folk up and, and you know, and, and we weren't leaving until they made a decision. And, and, you know, and, and, and I. And we thought that was the thing to do because that's what we were taught. But as I matured and began to understand God, I began to understand that the Lord is a gentleman. Amen. The Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He is not trying to force his way into anybody's heart. He's not, he's, the, the Lord is not a home invader. All right. <laughs> he, he ain't practicing home invasion. You got to open the door. He said, I stand at the door and knock. And he said, if any man will open up, he said, I'll come in. In other words, he's saying, if you don't open up, I ain't coming in. He's not going to force his way into people's heart. He's not going to use tragedy. He's not going to use scare tactics. He's not, he's not going to do different things to make you feel bad for, to, to manipulate you into opening your door. He will share with you that there are consequences for rejecting him, but opening the door and inviting Jesus has got to be your choice. Tell him it has to be the individual's choice. In the book of St. John, the sixth chapter, verse 44, the Amplified Classic Version, it says this. No one is able to come to me. And Jesus was talking. Jesus said, nobody can't come to me, can't give their lives to me unless the Father, Father God, who sent me, attracts that individual, draws that individual to him and gives that individual the desire to come to me. And then I'll raise him up in the last days, said Jesus said. What does that mean? That means we can't fail at offering people. People the opportunity to meet Jesus because it's not our job to save them. It is not our job to convince people to give their lives to the Lord. Our job is just to learn how to be a professional page turner. You need to get a PhD in page turning. 
You learn, you, you got the scriptures, you take your Bible, you turn your Bible around to them, you open it up and ask them to read out loud. Now you don't get a Bible like I have right now, my big, my big study Bible. You get the little, little evangelistic Bible that I shared with you before that's just, just you know, a, a little smaller Bible that you dedicate for the purpose of sharing your faith. In that Bible, you have outlined the, the, the seven share your faith scriptures that we gave you, and, and you highlighted them. You didn't scribble, scrap with no, with no red highlighter, uh, you know, no blue, dark blue highlighter where they can't read it. You know, you underline it real neatly, and the only thing you underline on that page of that Bible is, is the share Jesus verse that's leading them to the Lord. Out to the margin, you write down the page number for the next verse so you don't have difficulty finding it when it's time to move on. By the time you get to those seven verses, you know, you, you ask them a question. If you have not, if what you've been believing is not correct, would you want to know? When they say yes, that's your opportunity then to begin to share your faith. I mean, it, that's your, to open your Bible and share your faith. Remember, you got the five questions. That's just a thermometer. At the end of the fifth question, it asks, if you, what you are believing is not correct or com not complete, would you want to know? When they say, yes, I don't want to know, that's the time for you to pull out your little share Jesus Bible and begin to go through the seven scriptures. By the time you get to the, through the seven scriptures and sometime before you get to them, you know that they've become convicted and you know that they're ready to give their lives to the Lord. And then there are five little other questions you just ask them and it, and it, and it prepares their heart. So what we're going to do, we share those with you on Thursday, what those five questions were. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and what we're going to do now is share them with you again, but we're going to explain them. Now, the first, so to give out a praise if you're living. So you bring, so the first, uh, in fact, let's look in the book of St. John, uh, excuse me, 1 John. 1 John is at the end of the Bible. You all are not familiar with the scriptures. At the beginning of the gospel, you, know, uh, you have, uh, with the four, four gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then at the end of the Bible, you got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. So we're going, we're talking about the, the first John, which is near the end of the Bible, just before Revelation. 1st John, first chapter, verse 8 in the King James Version says this. If you say you have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth of God is not in us. If we confess our sins, God or he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from our all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So we are to the point of decision. I, I've, I've gone through the seven, uh, 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 excuse me, I've gone through the seven scriptural verses to show them that they need to be saved. By now, they know they need to be saved. So they know that they're a sinner. And, 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 and so now my question is, I, asked, I just read in that verse, I asked them this question, are you a sinner? Remember, there's five questions we're going to ask them. When we ask these five questions, we know that they're ready to give their lives to the Lord when, when they answer them, yes. Now, one, we ask them, are you a sinner? Now, that's, remember, five questions after you've done your seven that, 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 that let, let them know it's time to give their lives to the Lord. And when you ask them, are you a sinner? Remember, in the seven verses, it was Romans 3 and 23, which is the first one, and it says that the wages of sin is death. So we know, they know they need to do something about a sinful life. It's not enough for them to be good moral people. Because, see, sometimes in life, People think that they, if they are morally good, then in God's eyes, they are his child. They are saved. They think being a child of God means being a good person. Now, children of God should be good people, but God is not about good. He's about godly. In fact, we're going to show you later in the scriptures. The Bible says nobody is good except God. Nobody, is, see, you might think of yourself as good, and people might say, oh, yeah, that's a good person. Yeah, they're real nice. You know, that's, that's our definition of, of, of not. But in God's eyes, he said, none of y'all good. He, said, he says, all, uh, everybody is, is uh, uh, born in sin, shaping in iniquity. In fact, he said, no good thing dwells in our fleshly bodies. Right. That's what the word of God says. So I can't go around thinking that I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. Now, there are a lot of people that go. See, one of the weaknesses of the church and one of the weaknesses of, of, of what happens in the church is people. A lot of people in the church, they, they go to church, but the Lord is not in their lives. They think that the Lord is in their life because they joined the church, because they got baptized, because they became an officer. 
Even because they accepted the call to preach. You realize you can accept the call to preach and don't even be saved. Amen. Don't even have the Holy Ghost. Now what I said, the Bible said gifts and callings are without repentance. Which means the calling can be on my life before I come to know God at all. And, and because I hear the call, I can get a desire to preach and have never confessed Jesus, have never invited him in and never even develop a personal relationship. Now, that's why we have a lot of churches get started by people that never get bigger than just they, they, they family. You know, that, that never can submit unto anybody. They go out and start all these stuff of churches. The church never grows and they can't they can't submit to nobody because they want to do their own. Or they start having prayer bands in people's house. You know, they don't become a part of the church. They do their only prayer group because they never submit to the Holy Ghost. See, the thing about salvation is it's not only about getting forgiveness for sins. It's about accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life. Lord means he's in charge. So when I accept you, I ask for forgiveness because he can't come in and be Lord in a sinful place. The Bible says no, no sin can dwell in God's sight. So I get free from sin by saying, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart. I believe Jesus died in the rose. I accept payment. When I do that, then I'm no longer sinful uh, 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 in the eyes of God. Not in the eyes of people. I'm the same person I was before I said it. But in the eyes of God, I am a new creature altogether. And he can come in and live inside of me. But even when he comes in and live inside of me, I got to give him charge. God is not in charge of your life just because he comes into your life. That's just like, for instance, uh, you know, uh, you know if, if you go to somebody's house and they say, well, look, you know, you said they say my they say me casa su casa, which means my house, your house. You know, just act like it's your home. Now, you start going in the refrigerator, going inside their drawers, putting their feet up on 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 on, on their t tables and stuff. You're going to find out, even though they say me casa su casa, they're going to tell you, you better go to use casa. Because you ain't messing my house up like that. So you understand that they said those words. But those words had limitations. The same things we invite Jesus into our lives as Lord, but sometimes we limit him because we don't give him charge. The Lord's not going to stay home when it's time for worship. That, that, that's you. You still in charge. The Lord is not going to uh, 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 bypass uh, uh, supporting the church through the tithe and offering because, you know, the, the, the sales going on. That's you in charge. The, in other words, when the Lord is in charge, you're going to make decisions that are focused on things that are all about pleasing God. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to evaluate your choices. You're going to evaluate what you do and what you don't do to see how that lines up with God's priorities. So, you know, so are you a sinner? Yes, we all are born in sin. The scripture says it, it, sin is not the things you did before you got saved, though they might have been under the banner of sin. Sin, as far as God is concerned, is what you took upon you by no choice of your own from Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, they passed sin down into the gene pool of mankind. So we are born sinners. It's not our decision to be a sinner, but it is our decision to no longer be a sinner. When we recognize that Jesus died for our sins, he arose from the dead, and now I can accept his death and resurrection as payment for my sins and be a sinner no longer. Once you give your life to the Lord and genuinely receive the Holy Ghost, you can never be a sinner again. Did you hear me? Once you give your life to the Lord, you can never be a sinner again. Now, you can violate the things of God. You can go and you can you can you can have broken fellowship. You can you can disconnect from him. But 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 you can't go back and, and be reborn again. So, so you once you are born again, you have always been born again, but you still can be disconnected. You can choose to reject Jesus. How do I say that? The Bible said God had to, Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them was Judas. The Bible said Judas received the same anointing, the same conversion, the same relationship with Jesus as the other 11 disciples. But in the book of, of St. John, chapter 6, he said, have I not chosen you all 12? He said, yet one of you is a devil and you were a devil from the beginning. Now, how in the world could somebody put a part of Jesus' party and be Devil in nature. Be unsubmitted. Be unconverted. They were with the real son, not, not just the son of God. They were with God himself. The Bible said God himself was here on earth through the body of Jesus reconciling the world to himself. So he was here in the presence of almighty God and he still could make the choice 
to reject Jesus. So when we are presenting salvation to people, they still have the choice. So if they choose to reject God, I didn't fail. That was their decision. My, my assignment is not to take their choice away from them, not to take their ability to choose Jesus or not choose, choose Jesus away from them. My assignment is just to present them with the opportunity. They give the Holy Ghost the chance, the, the opportunity to work on their minds and on their hearts so they can make a qualified decision. Tell them they need to make a qualified decision. So the Bible says, but if they recognize their sinner, it asks for forgiveness of sins. The Bible said he will forgive them from the sins and cleanse them from anything that's unrighteous. So when I go through my seven shelves of script, Jesus scriptures and have them to read them out loud, I'm prepared. The Holy Ghost is preparing their heart for my commitment questions. So we got three different type of a question where we had the first with the five questions. And those are just spiritual thermometer to see whether God has been working in that person's life. Now, why do I want to know whether God's got their heart ready or working on? Of course, remember, he said they can't come until he put it in them to come. So those five questions are just the first five that we shared with you is just the thermometer to probe and see whether he's put it in their heart to be receptive in interest. Then after I ask those five questions and they've given me the, the, the liberty, they give me the freedom to pull out my Bible, I go through the seven sharing my faith questions, turning my Bible to them, asking them to read out loud, and then I ask them, what does this mean to you? I'm not there to give a Bible study to them, so I don't do the talking. All I do is, is turn my Bible and say, what does this mean to you? I'm not giving my opinion. I'm not explaining the scriptures. That's not your time to break down the scriptures and explain anything. If they don't understand it, I'll turn it back to them. And I said, well, read this again, please. I allowed the Holy Ghost to give them the understanding. Why do I want to let the Holy Ghost give them understanding about things that I already know what it means? Because I never want them to be able to say that I persuaded them through my opinion. I don't want them to say this is how my version, my insight is. No, I'm going to allow the Holy Ghost that's right there in the midst of it because he said, well, two or three are gathered in my name. And before I start sharing my faith, I'm also going to pray in the name of Jesus before I start talking because I recognize I'm not going to do the work. He's going to do the work. And so since, since the Holy Ghost is there, then if they don't understand, I just ask them to read it again, please. How many times I ask them to read it again? Until the Holy Ghost enlightens them. And we be there reading it 19 times. I say, look, I know you'll get a little frustrated, maybe, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, but just, just, just read it. And, and, and they might not understand why you keep telling them to read it. But you understand, you're waiting on the Holy Ghost to open their minds. Why do I need the Holy Ghost to open their minds? According to the Bible, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, that the unspiritual man, the unsaved person, cannot understand the things of God. So what good did it do for me to preach to them, for me to have an hours long Bible study with them when they don't have the capacity? You know, you know what it's like if you are, 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 are an English speaking person and I got up here and preached you a sermon in Spanish. It doesn't matter how sound, how much Holy Ghost, how clear it was in Spanish. It would do you. You might pick up a word here or two from what you heard. You, you know, you, you, hear, you know, come on, stars, bring you, know, you, you know, one or two little words you might pick up from the message. But you wouldn't get the message because that is not your language. You don't have that comprehension. It's the same way with the scripture. The Bible tells you that the mysteries of God are hidden from the natural man. That means a person can take a theology course, a Bible course in college. They don't come out knowing the Bible because they took it in college. They can major in it. They can get a Ph.D. in, in Bible, in theology. If they, don't, if they haven't given their lives to the Lord, they, they might know the, the, the literal words. They might know the literature. They might know the history, but they do not know what God meant. They don't even know God through even with a Ph.D. in theology, which is the study of God in the Bible, they don't know because it's spiritually understood. It's spiritually released. So don't let anybody intimidate you because they have a higher level of greed. And they tell you, oh, I took literature. I took Greek theology. I took Bible. Don't let them intimidate. That doesn't mean one single solitary thing. They're still ignorant. They don't know God. They don't know the word of God. So, but you don't debate with them. You don't argue with them. But you don't be intimidated. You just turn around and say, well, you read it again. You let the Holy Ghost bring clarity. Tell me that's the Holy Ghost's job. It is never our job 
when we share in our faith to debate with people about anything. Some people will say, yeah, you know, share, if, if I mean something, yeah, bring out your eyes, because they're ready for an argument. They, they like to argue. You know, they, they like to make points and they'll pull out something they heard Pastor Dollar say. They'll pull out something they heard Benny here and say, they, you know, they'll start throwing the stuff they heard about other preachers that try to take the conversation in another direction. But, but, but you got to understand, you just stay the course. You say, mm, that's, that, that's something, ain't it? Will you read this again, please? You don't let anything take you up being tunnel, tunnel vision focused. Will you read this out loud? Because you're allowing the Holy Ghost to enlighten them to what that means. Now, by the time you get through the seven scriptures, remember the, verse, the last of the, of the seven share your faith scriptures is if you were believing something that was incorrect or incomplete, would you want to know? And when they tell you, yes, I want to know, that's time for you then to begin uh, 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 to, to, to ask. Excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, excuse me. After you ask the five questions, you ask them if you believe if you if you're believing something that was not correct, would you want to then you go through your seven. When they get to the seven, you ask them about giving their life to the Lord. So they need to make a commitment. So we got five decision questions. What I just read for you when I said, are you a the sinner? Is getting them ready for the decision. Then the second thing you ask them, remember it's five, is do you want forgiveness? What does I ask them first? Are you a sinner? You know, they read the scripture, they know yes. By now they know they're a sinner. The second thing I ask them is, do you want forgiveness? Now, I told you some people believe that, you know, they can't be forgiven for all the crap they did. It's, even though they say, yeah, yeah, I want forgiveness. In their hearts and minds, they think there's some stuff they did that they never told anybody. There ain't no way in the world God's going to forgive. God's going to look over. Let me tell you something. God does not look over sin. That's how we think. God ain't going to look over this. No, he ain't going to look over it. He's going to forgive it. He's going to see it. He's going to know all the crap you did. He's going to know how nasty you was. And, he's gonna, and he'll use the blood of Jesus to clean you up. He is not going to look over anything we did or did not knew. He's going to acknowledge. See, he's going he's to look at it. He's going to pronounce you are guilty. From the beginning, you are guilty, but I pardon you. You're going to be guilty of sin. Guilty of being without him. But I forgive you. My son died and paid the price for your guilt in your place. That's where we are. So whenever you think that you haven't been where other people are, because we all started out there. You might not have been out on the streets doing what they were doing. That didn't make you better. A little rattlesnake is just as poison as a big rattlesnake. So y'all little sinners, you go into the same lake of fire as the big sinners. You might as well go on out and enjoy yourself if you ain't coming to God. Just do everything, you know, just, just go on out there, uh, 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 change your sex, uh, uh, use all the drugs you can, uh, you know, go, go on out in OBT, you know, uh, uh, get, you, get some cut-out pants with your palms walking out. You, know, uh, you might as well do it all. You might as well do it all if you ain't going to give your life to the Lord because regardless of whether you did a little bit of wrong, a whole lot of wrong, wrong is wrong. Ain't no way to do right doing wrong. That's my wife's song. Ain't no right way to do wrong. You gonna give your life to the Lord? Oh, you ain't gonna give your life to the Lord. We ain't gonna fuss about it. If you choose to go the broad and narrow way that leads to the death and destruction, that's purely your decision. But if you choose to go the narrow way that leads to life, the Bible said that it's constricted by pressure, which means it ain't always easy. Then God's going to help you make that path and you're going to have life. Give God a praise if you love him. Hallelujah. We asked the question, do you want forgiveness of sin? Now, we've already pointed out that the wages of sin was death. And by now they should know they need forgiveness. But remember, forgiveness is a choice to receive or not receive. You don't try to force that on them. You may want your loved one saved, but you can't make them be saved. You know, you, you, you can't. They got to choose it. The third thing that you ask them for a commitment question is, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross and arose from the dead? Now, this is a key element of salvation faith, a key element of it, because Jesus's death for your sins and having the power to get up out of death, out of the grave is, is key to our believing. He has the power to forgive us from our sins. If Jesus didn't get up. The rest of what we pre preaching is, is for nothing because everything hinges on the fact that he died on our behalf. And because he was God, death couldn't hold him down. So he got back up the grave. And the scripture says it says all power 
is now given unto me in heaven and earth. What kind of power? Not power just to show big, but power to forgive you of your sins. And the power to give you life in the place of death. And to bring you to be back with him. Tell your neighbor, I'm looking forward to that. So we had, are you a sinner? We had, do you want forgiveness of your sins? And the answer to that should be yes. The third thing you ask him is, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead? Because that's the key element to it. And, and, and we, we got that when we read in Romans 9, Romans 10 chapter 9 through 11 verse. And this is what it says. It says, with the heart, man believes in the righteousness. And with the heart, man is justified. And with the mouth, confession is made in the salvation. So when I confess, yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. But he arose from the dead and paid for sins on my behalf. I am confessing unto salvation. Now understand this. No one single thing is salvation. The Bible says if you believe, you be saved. It said if you be baptized, you be saved. It said if you confess with your mouth, believe with your heart, you shall be saved. It's a whole lot of elements to salvation. So don't, you can't just do one thing and say, oh, I got it now. No, you got to begin to learn of the rest of what goes into this mix of a, a, a process because it's more than just one thing. Amen. You don't just do one thing and just run back out in the street because even after I got saved, I got I to gotta grow in my understanding of how to nurture the Holy Ghost that's been placed inside of me. Right. The Bible says when we first get saved, what's inside of us is a little baby. It says, it's me, it says Christ is being formed inside of us. That means even though, even though I got the Holy Ghost, my ability to walk in it and my ability to benefit from it is like a little baby's benefit to be able to, to do all the things they're going to do as an adult. Potential is in there, but it's got to grow up. In your life, that's why you got to connect to a good church. That's why you got to do more and try to stay home and watch it on television. Because even though Christ is in you, it's being formed. And if you starve it, if you don't feed it, it will die of malnutrition. So when you get to a disease, when you get to bills, when you get to legal problems, when you get to other things that's trying to destroy your life, you won't have any power. Some people wonder why I can't pay my bills. You got no power over the devourer. There's a demon called the devourer that's mentioned in, 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 in Malachi uh, uh, 3, and, uh, uh, about 8 through 11. It speaks about the devourer. The devourer can't put his hand on an anointed, powered individual because the Holy Ghost says you have power over all the works of the enemy and nothing by any means will be able to harm you. But even though you got saved, if you aren't studying your Bible, if you aren't coming to church to fellowship and grow and mature, if you aren't serving, if you aren't sowing and giving the support, you are causing your, the spirit anointing inside of you to be malnourished. It won't have the strength. They used to say, uh, 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 you know, more prayer, more power. No prayer, no power. You know, that was a little cliche, but it's a reality of that. I, the more you miss church, the more you want to miss church. Did y'all hear that? The more you miss church, the more you want to miss church. The easier it gets to be. And you'll be making promises and you'll be asking and saying, I'm sorry. But the reality is the devil has is, is, is got his hands around your throat and he's choking you. And you don't understand why it's so difficult to do what used to be so easy. It's because he thinks he's got you again. And if he can persuade you this is just your feelings and not a demonic impression. He will trick you into making the choice that it's you when it's him. You all think the devil is sitting back just letting you walk out in the glory. You think he's going to sit back and it's easy just smoking on a pipe, sucking on a bud. While you get your life ready for the blessings of God, for the anointing of God. You know, I want you to understand the Bible says that we're supposed to have, uh, uh, he came to give us life and have it more abundantly. Whether it's being healthy, whether it's having wealth, you know, whether it's having a relationship, those things are givens. They're what we're supposed to have. It, it, right now, it's a lot of stuff in the media about something Pastor Dollar said about tithing and offering and prosperity. People don't let folk lead you down a dark path. It's God's good pleasure. He said that you will have the keys to the kingdom, which you can have the best of everything. You should not pursue and go after prosperity. But when you live right, prosperity will come after you. Wealth will come after you. Health will come after you. You know, forget all the cliches. 
God wants you to have the best because you are kingdom kids. All my kids don't have the best, but I want them to have the best. All my life, I try to steer them towards what was going to be most prosperous and rewarding in their life. They still made their own choices. They still do not make their own choices. But if they were follow my guidance and counseling, I'm here to tell you, they would have the good life. That's the same way it is with God. He wants you to have the, what is the good, scripture speak about us having the good life. What is the good life? The good life is the best thing this life has to offer for you. This life doesn't have the same thing to offer for all of us. Many of you in here are not going to be billionaires. Some of you might, but everybody ain't going to be a billionaire. But a billionaire status is designed for some folk. Whatever the best life for you is, God wants you to have it. But you ain't going to just have it because he wants you to have it. Some people say, well, Pastor, God wants me to have it. They give it to me. It don't work like that. If God wants you to have it, you got to be in the position to receive it. You ain't going to just get it because he got it for you. You got to make the right kind of choices to be in line to receive what he has. Years ago, years ago, I, I've in my heart and mind, I've always desired more than just working for a person to, you know, to, just to having the wage from people. And I'm not saying don't have, you know, have a job, but I'm saying I always wanted more than that. So I always had a mind to start a business. Now, now, I mean, from, from a childhood, I mean, uh, 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 Auntie Proctor or something, so from a childhood, I mean, I remember one Christmas uh, years ago when I was a kid, maybe 10, 11 years old, uh, my, my family gave me this, this cotton candy machine, a little toy, you know, like y'all gonna have the little brownie ovens, y'all, you know, the kids do, when the, the play play ovens. Well, I had a little cotton candy machine, you just put sugar in it, and it would actually literally make cotton candy. So, you know, I, I, it came to my mind. Well, you know, just think about all the money you can make making cotton candy. So, I, you know, I, I, I started advertising in my school. And as the kids and, and our house was uh, uh, right in past, as people got to school, they passed my house. And so I would have the kids line up out the door coming in the garage, you know, with me selling cotton, cotton candy at my little machine. You know, I, uh, uh, I, I, you know, as a young kid, I always loved horses. So I taught my parents and to buy me a horse. Well, you know, a horse was okay, but horses, you know, had to feed them. They cost them, you know. And, and I, my grandma was the one who got it, got it from it and, and raised them, so she didn't have that much money. So what I would do, it, I'm, I'm, you know, the black folk neighborhood didn't really have that much over there. You know, uh, you know, they want to ride for free. <laughs> but but I but I would go into the white people's neighborhoods and 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 their parents would well, we let we let our child uh, ride your pony and I said well yeah for fifty cent you know and so they give me fifty cent I walk them down to the corner come back you know and another being like I always had an entrepreneurial mind to make money but it took me years to recognize having a good business idea was not having a god business idea so. In that period of time, I had a cosmetology college in one apart. Some of you don't realize that for several years. It did okay, but I had to work harder and invest more in it than I made out of it. So it turned it loose. I had a landscaping business. We used to go around putting sod in people's yard. You know, and, and, you know that, that worked as hard, but made very little. I had a daycare center long before we had a, no one over Faith Academy, and that didn't do much. I had a restaurant in Sanford. It was called New Guys Famous Fried Chicken, you know, because I saw the people in Popeyes making so much money. So I got their recipes and I opened them New Guys instead of Popeyes and I had their recipes. And, but it just didn't do for me what it did for Popeyes. And I had all these various business, uh, 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 multi-level marketing, Shackley, uh, Amway, all these different things I, I did. I tried to sell dogs. I used to raise Dobermans. Raise, I was always trying to do something to raise money, but none of it ever really did much more than drain me of the money I had until I finally got to the point that I recognized my calling was the pastor. Nothing else prospered. I started a lot. I invested a lot. It cost me a whole lot of time, but it didn't prosper. It did okay, but it didn't prosper. Made me feel bigger, but I'm just gonna have my own business, but it didn't prosper. But when I recognized God had called me to pastor, and I stopped trying to go after business and money because I wanted to provide some better for my family, and start focusing on building the pastorate, then the money started coming, and God began to give me kingdom ideas for business and not just good ideas for business. That's the difference. A good idea is when you do what you like to do or you got the time to do, but God didn't say do it. And you're okay with it, but it'll never really prosper you where he wants to take you. And when I learned to submit to God ideas, then we begin to prosper. 
we started the school with one kid, with one teacher who was my wife, Jennifer, and she didn't find out she was gonna be a teacher until the weekend before school started. We started, and now, I think we've been in business 13, 14 years. We've employed up to 17 people. You know, that prosperity came because I learned to submit to the plan of God and start trying to make my own plan. Start not try, starting to prove myself and do my own thing. I wanted my family to be proud of me, but all that stuff I was doing because of what I wanted without considering what God wanted out of me never came to much of anything. To the outside, it looked like we were doing good, but I knew the struggles. I knew how much was going short. You know, I, 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 I remember at my restaurant sitting out front watching the repo man come and jack my car up and, and, and take my car away, you know, without me having to wonder how I'm going to get home. I, I, the tears running down my eyes because I've done the best I could, you know. And what Jennifer did was gave me her car. So go on home. And she stayed at the restaurant we was working in overnight so she could be there in the morning and open back up. Back then, because I didn't know how to follow the plan of God. Even though I was saved, even though I had the Holy Ghost, I didn't know how to hear God. See, when you believe Jesus died on the cross from you, that's the start. That is not the whole matter. You got to tune your ears to hear the Lord and follow the Lord, and that comes with you committing time and surrendering your life to the Lord. So the next question becomes. Are you willing to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Even though I was saved, I had not surrendered. I told you all, I, I spent about three months in prison. And a lot of that was because I had not surrendered. Now, this is after I started preaching, after I'm pastoring. You know, now, when I was pastoring the first time, I had not submitted to pastoring. It's just I went to a town and started sharing my faith. And so many folk got saved. And I didn't want to walk off and leave them because the churches around there really were not that, that I knew of, were not that interested in, in, in holding, because they were young people, holding young people together. So I stayed in that town and I established a church. I didn't do that because I knew the call of my life was to pastor and shadow church. I did that because I cared about souls. And at about this, I told God when I did that, I said, look at Lord, I ain't looking to pastor. I, I'm looking to be rich. And I said, uh, by the time I get to be 50, this is what I'm telling God. I want to have at least, you know, back then my faith was small. I want to have at least $500,000 in assets. You know, to me, that was big back then. You know, and Lord didn't argue with me. He didn't say anything. So when I said, God, I'm going to give you seven years. Now, see, some of y'all may not talk to God like this. I talked to him like that and kind of regretted that I did, but I did. I said, I'll give you seven years. You know, so I was true to my word. I was faithful in Mocha, Georgia. I stayed there preaching. Folk got saved. I mean, we, we, we did a lot of great things there. But at year seven, I could not see what God had given me my half, my $500,000. I, I, I chose one of the young men that was in the church, turned the church over him, and I got my stuff together, and I moved to Sanford, Florida. Left the church, moved to Sanford, Florida. Now, you got to understand this. When I did that, I was doing it because I was offended with God. I was upset because he didn't do what I wanted him to do. And, and the people y'all need to understand, God ain't saving you for you to give him orders. All right. <laughs> He's saving you for you to submit to his orders. But that, that wasn't my frame of thinking. So I gave him his seven years. He didn't do it, so I moved to Florida. Things got rougher here in Florida. You know, I couldn't feed my family here in Florida because I'm out of place. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I got the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. I prophesied. I cast out devils. But I'm rebelling against God because he didn't give me the finances that I wanted. So I get down here. I can't feed my family. We struggle. I mean, we have a hard times. So the job I was on, I start keeping some of the money I was collecting. Now, yeah, see, I'm being political, Rick. No, I was stealing. You know, we say, you know, you know how you, you know how we do it when we talk about ourselves. I'm a big political correct. I was keeping some of, you know, no, I was stealing money. You know, I was collecting money and I wasn't turning in is what I was doing. And, 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 and eventually they caught up with me, you know. And so, you know, when they caught up with me because of the, 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 the responsibility I had, the title I had, they were hard on me. There was anybody else. Now, I think it was about a thousand dollars total. And they gave me five years in prison for a thousand dollars. First offense, you know, but they were trying to make an example of me. So I, it crushed my heart. God knows it crushed my heart. And I went to jail. All right. And so I'm sitting in jail, 
you know, and, 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 I, and they will go through the process. I get to prison. So every morning at the prison, I got my Bible and I'm reading them Psalms of David when the sun rises. You know, I'm trying to find God again. You know, I'm, I'm trying to find God, you know. And, and, and at that time, uh, 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 about the third month, my wife called me. She said, well, look, she said, well, the attorney, your attorney went back and talked to the judge. She said, because the probation officer that did your investigative report, they call him uh, PSI. Pre-sentence investigation report. He said he told the judge that his supervisor falsified a report so that you would get jail time because they try and teach you a lesson. Mm. And, and, and the probation officer said, I couldn't I couldn't do that to him, you know, you know, because we got to know one another. But he said, no, I couldn't do that to them. So he went to the judge. And so they brought me out of prison. But they made me sign a statement saying that I would not sue them for falsifying. It. I ain't, I wouldn't try. Look, I wouldn't try. To make, I want to get out. Forget the money. Get me, uh, make, let us free. <laughs> now I know some of y'all go to jail and go to prison and you talking about oh, that's just a nickel. That's just a nickel. Five years, that's just a nickel. For Ten years, just that. No, look, get me out of here. I won't be here no more. You know, so I signed a little document and I got out. Now understand this. All of that was because even though I gave my life to the Lord, even though many people had been saved in my ministry, I had cast out devils. I had the gifts working. I had never surrendered my heart. Even though I have given my soul, my heart and my mind, I still control. I choose what I want to do. You know, in the church right now, some of you may be living far below what God has for your life because you still in charge of your life. You determine when you come to church, when you don't come to church. You determine when you give, when you don't give. You determine who you talk to, who you don't. You determine who you're going to forgive and who you ain't going to forgive. You're going to determine who you're going to have something to do with and who you ain't having. To. See, you still trying to you still think. You in charge when you gave your life to the Lord. You ain't in charge. And he has as well letting you know that in no uncertain terms. Now, once I got that down deep inside of me, he ain't have no problem out of me anymore. And since he had no more problem out of me, my life began to increase and abound. I begin to do better financially. My family began to do better. I mean, everything began to come together. But it didn't just hinge on my salvation. It hinged on my surrendering to God after my salvation. So even though you were telling people about surrendering after the Lord, there is still more. Tell your neighbor, there is more. So you're going to ask them, you know, uh, you, you're going to ask them, you know, do you, you, you know, are you ready to surrender your life to Christ? Now, this is a very important question because it's important the person understands it's going to cost them something when they say yes beyond the confession. Now, I ain't trying to scare them away, but I ain't trying to make them think that, you know, ain't no price to pay either because Jesus paid the price. They're going to have to pay a price. And the price is denying themselves. Some things they're going to have to tell themselves no. Some people they're going to have to disconnect with. Some things they used to enjoy doing, they got to say no to and choose to find something else to enjoy. God's not going to make them. He's not going to scare them. But it's going to be back to that surrendered life. When we surrender our lives to the Lord, he gives us the best quality of life. But if you still try to control your own life after salvation, you will have some hardships. You can have some, some rough things happen and you're going to think it's because God don't love you, didn't notice you, but it's going to be consequences of your decision. Tell them, but there are consequences to every decision. Give God a praise if you love him. Turn to the book of St. Luke with me, if you will. St. Luke, the 14th chapter. So that question, the fourth question we asked was, are you ready or willing to surrender your life to Christ? St. Luke 14 chapter, verse 33. It's very important that people understand there's a cost. St. Luke 14, 33, Amplified Classic, Jesus talking. So then, any of you who does not forsake, renounce, surrender your claim to, give up, and say goodbye to all that he has, cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? That just means I got to be willing to do whatever it takes to please God. Some things in general, we all have to do. But some things are tailor made for you. Some things you do, I don't do. So God don't have to ask me to give that up because I wasn't doing that from the start. So we all have to be honest. What kind of things in our lives get in the way of your salvation? 
get in your way of you pleasing God the way you know you should please God. And when God identifies that to you, you got to make the decision. He said to renounce it, to surrender your claim to it, which means the fact you got a right to do it, to give it up and to say goodbye to it. Some things you don't want to say goodbye to, but, but you got to say goodbye if you're going to stay in right relationship with God. Give him praise if you love him. Hallelujah. Turn to the book of St. Matthew's, the 19th chapter for me. St. Matthew's 19th chapter, beginning at verse 16. Matthew's 19th chapter, verse 16. And it says this, Amplified Classic. And behold, there was a man saying, teacher, and this is how the man addressed Jesus. What excellent, perfect, and essentially good deed must I do to possess a certain life? See, some people think in and out of the church that their good deeds is what makes them good in the eyes of God. But I told you, the Bible said there's nothing good, no, no good person but God. Good is not an impact to God. Godliness it is. So don't think that you're OK because you don't do all the stuff you see folk doing. All right. You know, this uh, cup last week. I was going to get a breakfast from Wendy's and as I passed by the dumpster, it was a guy sitting outside the dumpster going through one of the garbage bags eating. You know, and I, and, I, and I saw him and I backed back up and I said, come here, brother. And, and he came over and I gave him twenty dollars. I said, I said, you know, bless yourself real good. And I gave him twenty dollars so he can go get something real eat out of the dumpster. Now, I understand this. That was a good deed, but that don't make me good. Because I do uh, community functions and, uh, and, and I chair and I donate to charitable contributions and, and I volunteer. And that, that don't make me good in the eyes of God. Now, that might be good in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God, the only thing that's good is when he looks at your life. And he doesn't see you anymore. He sees Jesus. Come on down a bit further. Verse 20, 17. And Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about a perfectly and essential good thing? Because this man want to know what good deed can I do to be saved? That's what that means. He said, he, he, he says, there came a man and said, teacher, what excellent and perfectly and essential good deed must I do to possess eternal life? He said, what kind of good works do I need to have? So I can be with you. And Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about perfectly and essential good? He said, there's only one who is good, perfect and essential. And that's God. Say there's one person good. That's my father. If you would enter into life or you want to be saved, you must continually keep the commandments, which is follow the scriptures. And the man said to him, what sort of commandments? Uh, which ones are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus answered, you shall not kill you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is the Ten Commandments. And the young man said, I've observed and done all these since I was a child. Still, what am I missing? The Bible said, Jesus answered him, if you would be perfect, which means you will be what the father wants you to be. That is to have spiritual maturity. He said, yeah, you've been doing all the works. You've been following the letter of the law, but you ain't mature yet. You, you, you haven't spiritually arrived like you think you're. In one passage of the scripture, the Bible says the young man ran up to Jesus. I, I envision run up, sliding up to him. And he already talked to his boys in my mind and told them, watch this, watch this. Because he, he think he got it together. He'd been following the commandments. And he'd been going to church. He'd been a good person. And he think, he, see what he wants to do is hear Jesus validate him in front of everybody. Said, oh, yeah, you, you're a good person. You're already essentially good. You got it made. The Bible said in the, other ver in the other passage, it said that Jesus looked at him and loved him. And out of love, Jesus corrected him. He says, he says, and Jesus asked him, if you would be perfect, that is to have spiritual maturity, which accompanies self-sacrificing character. What does he tell him? He said, now, it's not about you being good. It's about you having my character. He says, go and sell all you have and give what you have to the poor and you will have riches in heaven and come and be my disciple. Side with my part and follow me. The Bible said, but when the young man heard this, he went away sad, grieved and in much distress for he had great possessions. Now, the possessions, the money was not the problem. So don't you stop thinking with well, that's, that's why I'm broke, Pastor, because, you know, you, when the money, money, you know, money is evil. The money root of it. Ain't no way in the Bible where it says money was the root of all evil. So don't be listening to them folk that don't know the scripture. The Bible says the love of money 
which is what this person had, was the root of all evil. When you love possession more than the provider, that's a problem. It is not a problem for you to be rich. It's not a problem for you to be on a high income level. That's God's will, divine will. But he always wants you to have things in the right priority, which is him first, his ways first. Don't take shortcuts in business that you know, well, if, if, you know if, if, if it's discovered that, that, that it's going to make him look bad, you look bad for him. No, 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 no. You do things right. You be straight down the line. Don't take shortcuts. Don't be, don't be crooked. Don't be trying to do t- take the the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the hot stuff, you know, from the boosters. You know, know what y'all call when you say somebody shoplifters. Y'all calling the boosters. That's another political correct. They don't share, say I'm buying shoplift stolen stuff. They say I, I, the booster came by my house. That's what they call them. No, you do what's right because you are a reflection of Christ. He said the man left disheartened in grief, great grief. Because he had great possessions. He thought he had it made because he was good, but he had not surrendered. There were portions of his life God was not in charge of. What portions of your life, now this is away from my sharing your faith, is God not in charge of? Yes, you come to anointed word. Yes, you pray. Yes, you speak in tongues. Yes, you teach the, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 exhortations. Yes, you preach from time to time. Yeah, you sing. But what part of your life Is he not in charge of? You don't have to guess at that. As I ask that question, I know stuff pops your mind if there is any. That's the way it works with us. Whenever, see, the same way when I say what part of your life is not surrendered and things come to your head that you question, it's the same thing that happens when you share in your faith and you read that scripture. The Holy Ghost brings things to their mind. Like right now, the Holy Ghost is bringing stuff to your mind. The possessions were not the problem. The problem was the, the priority value he placed on the positions in his life. We got to make sure that our family, our friends are willing to accept Jesus, but they want to, but you want them to understand the cause. The last question was, are you ready to invite Jesus into your life? Turn to St. John one. Are you ready to invite Jesus in your life? Now, while you're finding that, remember there were five commitment questions. Number one, bring, bring them decision by asking them, are you a sinner? Number two, do you want forgiveness for your sins? Number three, do you believe Jesus died on the cross for you and that he arose from the dead? Number four, are you willing to surrender your life to Christ? And now we're at number five. Are you ready to invite Jesus into your life? St. John 1, turn there. Now, why do I say that? Because Jesus comes to us and knocks. How do you know when Jesus is knocking on the door of a person's life? Because a lot of times they just begin to feel they're missing something. They'll be going to say things like, well, you know, I need, know I need to better. I know I need to get back in the church. I know I need to come. When you start saying things like that, that's the Lord knocking. That is not them opening, but they already know they need to change. That's the knock. That's how he lets them know, I'm, I'm trying to get through to you. But they don't have to open the door. He's not going to force his way in. I told you he is not a home invader. You got to invite him in through the door. St. John 1, verse 11. Jesus came to them which belong to him, and to his own, talking about the Jews, his own domain, creation, things of the world. And they who were his own, talking about the Jewish nation, did not receive him, did not welcome him, because the Jews rejected him. The Gentile, which is everybody else, had the opportunity to receive him. It says, he came to them, and they didn't welcome him. Verse 12, but to as many as did receive him, look at the name and say, that's me. As many as did receive him and welcome him, he gave them power, privilege, right to become children of God. That is those who believe in, adhere to, trust in and rely on his name. We need to invite these people to receive Jesus and accept them into into the hearts. We're at the point you ask them, are you ready to accept Jesus? When you ask them that question, shut up. When you say, are you ready to see Jesus? Don't talk anymore. (laughs) Zip it. You just be quiet and look at him. You ask him the question, are you ready to receive Jesus in your heart? Be silent. Wait for them to speak first. Now, they might start doing something, acting like, like, you know, like this. Yes. Somebody said, Pastor, how long you be silent? How long will it take for them to speak? 
You let the Holy Ghost do the work. You, you don't you don't start feeling the pressure. And so now you start trying to explain and let them know why they need to get. No, no. Remember, it's their choice. It's their decision. Ain't but two answers. Somebody said, pass how long you wait. Wait until you get one or two answers. Either yes or no. If they say no, you ain't trying to force it. Yes. They say, now, I'm saying, I can't overemphasize you how important it is when you ask them, are you ready to give your life to the Lord at this point that you be silent? Also, that you start praying with inside, inside of you. you. You might not know what you need to pray about. The Lord might bring to your mind what you need to pray about. This is probably one of the greatest points of spiritual warfare that you will ever encounter as a believer. When you're at the point and you ask them, are you ready to give your life to Jesus? And you be silent. You have stepped on the battlefield. Spiritual warfare is not stuff coming out of heaven, like people in church tend to say. Spiritual warfare happens on the mind, the battlefield of the mind. You've asked that question, the Holy Ghost is working on their mind, Demonic forces are working at the same time. They both have a tug of war going on over that person's decision. You can't get in it. You have to pray for it on the side. You don't start praying out loud. You get everybody. Blah, blah, blah. No, you keep it. If you, if you got to do tongues, you keep it on the inside. Don't start up. That's all right. Don't, don't bother me. No, 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 you be still. You be silent. You don't do nothing to distract them. You let the word of God work on them. You just you take, look at them and say, Pastor, say, shut up. You pray in silence, whatever you need to pray. You may need to pray that God will release some grace, some mercy upon their mind of the person that's now battling with demonic forces. Pray that Satan and the forces of darkness will be bound and not be able to, 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 to hinder what's going on inside of them. You also pray that the Lord binds their flesh. Because their flesh also will begin to bring fear and reservations because it don't want to let go. It don't want to surrender. But to surrender has to be the anointing and power of God. Remember, they can't overcome their flesh except God gives it to them. So you're praying in silence. God bring the grace and the mercy to overcome the flesh. We don't open our mouth and say a thing until they say something. Let the Holy Ghost do his job. You just shut up and stay out of the way. Wait until you get the answer. And there's only one or two possible answers. Yes, I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. No, I'm not. When they say yes, you have, simple, you have a simple sinner's prayer for them. What is a simple sinner's prayer? Repeat after me is what you tell them. Say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come into my heart. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, I rose from the dead, and I accept his death as payment for my sins. When they do that, in the eyes of God, they are new creatures. Now, once again, that's not all they got to do in their salvation walk, but that's all God is asking for at the time. So for as God is concerned, they are now saved. They have now received salvation. They don't need to do anything else at this point except begin to rejoice that they are now new creatures and you rejoice right along with them. You don't hold back here with just, well, let me tell you something. I know you, I know you say the words, but I, I ain't heard you speak in tongues yet. So until I hear you, you know, you, you, know, you ain't, no, 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 that, no, stay in your place. When God gets ready to give them the Holy Ghost, have them speak in tongues, he'll do that. At this point, he said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one saved sinner than there is a 99 folk that's already made it and feel they got no reason to point, repent. So what you supposed to be doing right now is rejoicing with them and encouraging them and the rest to come on later. Give God a praise if you love him. It is so easy to lead people to Christ and it's so rewarding once they did it. There's nothing else you could do for a person in life that will make such an impact that they will never forget like leading them and to be introduced to Jesus. Even if you all stop being friends, even if they don't go to the church you went through, they'll never be able to tell their story without telling about you. And it'd be the complete story because the Lord used you to introduce them to Jesus. Now, I want you to understand this. God is doing some great things. If he's if you give your life to the Lord. In fact, if you haven't given your life to the Lord 
And you heard those four, those four questions I asked. Remember what we asked about commitments. And that's, I guess this is a good time to ask them again before you make a commitment. We told you, number one, are you a sinner? You know, you know number two was, do you, wanna, do you want forgiveness for your sins? Number three, did Je- do you believe Jesus died on the cross and arose from the dead in your behalf? Number four, are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus? And number five, are you ready to accept them in your heart? If you've done that, we want to know about it. We want you to call us, air code 407-886-4989. Air code 407-886-4989. You can contact us on our email. My email is oacministries at earthlink.net. oacministries at earthlink.net. Last but not least, you can contact us through our website. Enter in your search browser, anointedwordfwc.com. Anointedwordfwc.com. Our page will open up. You're going to see things about our ministry. You can read things about our pastors, about our officers, our vision, the other ministries that we offer, you know, that you might be a blessing in your life. Or you can leave your questions. Now, you can also support us through our website. We have two modes of online giving for your tithe, for your offering, for your special gifts. And we give through tithely and cash app. Touch either one or either one of those in the website and a prompt will open up to show you how to use it. Now, you can also support us or send your testimonies or questions through the normal mail by addressing your envelope to Anointed Word Family Worship Center, Post Office Box 1509, Apopka, Florida, 32704. Put your return address on your envelope. Now, you can continue to watch messages just like these, dynamic messages to show you how to share your faith, to show you how to walk in the anointing and power of God, you know, uh, by going to YouTube and also on Facebook. Now, on YouTube, you enter in Anointed Word FWC. When the page first opens up, that will not be our personal page. That's other ministries piggybacking on us because we've been doing so good. But touch that blue uh, icon. It's it's a dove over a Bible, a blue icon. And our personal page will open up and you're going to see other messages in the archives. So you might find some other messages that's dealing more specifically with whatever challenges you're having right now. But on on, uh, YouTube, there's also a little red button. It says subscribe. Touch that. Be a friend with us. You know, be be a, a evangelistic partner. You don't have to give any further information. You don't even have to watch it on, on, uh, on, on YouTube, but touch that and it, and it puts you in a number of uh, 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 people that are supporters of us. So they replay our messages more times down through the week there on, fa- on uh, YouTube. But you can also watch us on Facebook. Now you're in your own Facebook on Knowing Word FWC. Our page will open up. You can hit the like button, hit the share button. I mean, uh, definitely down through the week, uh, you know, replay the message, share share the message over again because there are people that may not be watching these messages right now because there are other services that they're attending or or going to, but but they're, they're not hearing this in their churches. So I'm not one that thinks we don't own the church, but I do know all churches are not preaching the same message at the same time. This is what they need to hear. When churches are not growing, this is what they need to hear. Because you need to understand, you can tell who in a church is being active by the kind of people that's being drawn. When the older people are being drawn, that means the older people are sharing the faith. When the church has very few young people, has few young adults, that means the young people, the young people, adults, they may be coming to church, they are not sharing their faith. Why did I say that? Because the Bible says each kind bears after its own kind. So that means when you see a certain segment of people missing out of the church, then that segment of people that's in the church is being lazy. They're not doing their part as far as sharing their faith. I've shown you how to share your faith uh, without fear. Don't matter who it is, you know, you don't have to feel intimidated. You can begin to let the word work. When I first began to evangelize, I was only 17 years old when I, I was in college. My, uh, my second year of college, get, and gave my life to the Lord. We were so excited about the Lord. We, our little group that was there in our dormitory, we formed the little evangelistic team. It was six of us. And we started traveling all over the state of Georgia, evangelizing, sharing, and people got saved. Every, in, the, in the college I was in, by the time that year was over, all of the, uh, uh, the young people, especially of color, in the whole dormitory, had given their lives to the Lord because we shared our faith. Everywhere we went, we were looking for opportunity. It didn't matter. We, I, I was playing pool with somebody. I used to go up in our game and play pool. While I'm playing pool, I'm sharing my faith. You know, and, and by, by the time the game was over, we over to the corner having prayer. Didn't matter where it was. I wasn't ashamed. I wasn't afraid. I didn't worry about burning by being asked that. People, that's what we got to get back to. 
looking for opportunities to share our faith. You young people, want to see more young people in church? Have the church give more to the young folk? Share your faith. You old people, still looking for a husband? Share your faith. I don't mean share your faith when you want to be a husband. Just share your faith. God will take care of that. You know, when, when our church was much younger, we had a lot more men. But you know why we had a lot more men? We had a lot more single young women. You know, at that time. So, you know, men drew, I mean, women drew the men. Men drew the women. We used to go around, and, and I, I, this is kind of a sidebar, when I was first, uh, when I was in Moultrie and we was in our uh, early 20s and uh, late teens, when we, when we ran around to, to share our faith, that, you know, that's what we did. You know, we, we let people see who we was and we drew the kind of people, the age groups that we were. So when you look at a church and a certain age group is missing, you know who in the church is not sharing your faith because we're going to reach our own kind. Give God a praise if you love it. I'm here to tell you, Jesus loves you. And the way you show him your love is by sharing your faith. And guess what else? Pastor Cobb loves you too. Give him praise again.